ahead. We'll get right on with it, if that's okay with you. It's wonderful. Thank you. And uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, see your face even on a computer screen. <laughs> Maybe we should say a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who are in all places and fill all things. Treasure of good things, giver of life, come and dwell in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O oh, good one. Amen. Amen. Well, well dear ones, uh, Father Stephen asked me if I would make some reflections on the subject of St. John of Sinai and the ladder of divine ascent, which was the commemoration for this last Sunday. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. So that's what I'd like to do. I have uh, about 50 minutes before I have to run over to do services here. So if it's okay, I think I'll, I'll try to go for maybe 25 or 30. Is that right, Father? And then stop. That's fine. Whatever you'd like is fine. You guys can uh, can take me. You guys can take me from there. I'm not looking at Lee Corderi, am I? Yes, yes you are. Sir. What in the world, sweetheart? <laughs> I've, I've given you a hug. I'm uh, giving you a hug. Oh, my gosh. You are I so missed. Her. You are so missed. Uh, well, you are, too. I miss you all. You can't have her back, Father. Sorry. That's just the way that is. So. You, uh, you Southern, where's your Southern hospitality? <laughs> it only goes so far. <laughs> it only goes, yes. Ay, ay, ay. So St. John of Sinai, we don't actually know exactly his birthday, uh, but most people think that he was born in the middle of the 6th century uh, and that he lived until, well into the 7th century. He's super famous for... His, uh, his text, which is a work of a lifetime that we call the ladder. This text is the compilation of decades and decades of conversations and spiritual experience, both as a junior monk himself, as a pilgrim to many places throughout the Christian world where there were really serious ascetics, really serious monastics, and to whom he plumbed with questions and made deep observations, and also from his life as the abbot of the monastery at the base of Mount Sinai, where he spent the last decades of his life and where he reposed. This book, interestingly, um, which is so cherished by Orthodox Christians, uh, isn't just a classic. I mean, you will find it, for instance, in the classics of Western spirituality. That's one of the editions you can find in English. So it's, it's considered by Christians uh, of East and West to be a classic. But for us, it's not a classic that you have to just periodically go back and read, you know, like, like some Catholic would read God. Would read God. It's, it's a classic that has been planted into the liturgical cycle of the church. And so it's kept fresh in the life and the experience of Orthodox Christians to this day. And so all Orthodox no, you don't have to be particularly devoted or spiritual to know who St. John of Sinai is and to know about the Ladder of Divine Ascent. Besides the book holding forth uh, on the fourth Sunday of the Great Fast, we're also, I think, most of us familiar with the icon of the Ladder, which has Christ at the very top, uh, encouraging those who are struggling uh, for paradise. St. John is actually depicted as the abbot of Sinai, about two-thirds, three-quarters of the way up the ladder. All sorts of other monks are scaling the ladder. Some are falling off. Some are being pulled off by the demons. It's kind of a, a scary uh, icon in some sense because it has the depiction of these dark demons. And of course, at the base is uh, death as a great sea monster with its mouth open, eating uh, those who have have been detoured in their Christian life, so to speak, and have stopped ascending. Uh, and this is really the first note I want to make, is that the latter presents us with a vision, an overall broad vision of the Christian life as a life of ascent, of movement and ascent, which, which shows that the Christian life, as the church received it from the Lord himself, uh, is not a collection of ideas alone. It's not an ideology. It is a, a life pattern 
it is an engagement in struggle and it's a movement for us it's uh, it's a calling to seek first in jesus's word to seek first above everything else the kingdom of god and his righteousness and then to find a way to take all the stuff of life and to mediate it to let it settle around that central ladder so when you're looking at the icon and you see the ladder in the center you should think as we're always trying to find ourselves in icons and to see yourself accepting the quest accepting the ambition to seek the kingdom of god above all things and to make the sense of your relationships of your work uh, of your free time to fill that around the quest so that it all holds together in a way that's pleasing to God. This is the, the first note I'd like to say. Also, I want you to see that this is the, this is, let's say 700 or so the, this is between six and 700 already for hundreds and hundreds of years, monasticism has been at the center and heart of the church. St. Anthony was born in 250, and he fell asleep in the Lord in 356, and he won so many to the deserts of Egypt that St. Athanasius the Great, his spiritual son and his biographer, uh, said that at his time, uh, by the middle of the fourth century, half of the entire Christian population, and most scholars estimate about half of the Roman Empire had converted by this time. And at that time, the Roman Empire was about 60 million people. So 30 million uh, are Christians. And St. Athanasius said half lived in the desert. Can you imagine? For us Orthodox, uh, we're blessed if we have a monastery like within five or six hours of driving distance from us. I mean, that's blessed. I live in Southern California, and there is not a single monastery in this metropolis of over 22 million people not a single monastery in southern california we have to drive two hours north up to the southern portion of what's called central california uh to to get to our our nearest monastery that was not the way it was at the time of saint john of sinai uh, and so today one of the results of having such little monastic experience here in the secular west which is very unlike most orthodox lands is that we, we almost have, because of the relative scarcity of monasticism, we, also, we almost have to kind of justify the existence of monastics. Um, and, you know, most pious Orthodox would never do that, that they, they know better. But there's a lot of Orthodox who don't really see the need for monasteries and aren't really sure about them, what they're really for. I want you just to see that at the time that St. John is doing his, his spiritual quest and, and documenting it, Monasticism is just front and center uh, in Christian experience. Uh, and that's normal for us. Our lives are very secularized when it comes to that. And monasticism is one of its great contributions to life for Christians is that it stands as a signpost. It stands as a, a flag waving, saying, the only justification for our existence is the love of Jesus Christ. That's the only reason we exist. The reality of the kingdom of God is the reason for our existence here. And St. Athanasius the Great says monasticism is one of the two chief apologetic proofs that Jesus conquered death and that the devil has been dethroned and uh, that Christ is risen. He said the two are the existence of the martyrs and the joy in which they smile in the face of death. And the second is the great embrace of monastic life by Christians, neither of which ever existed before the coming of Christ and his defeat of our enemies. And both of which were a natural outcropping, a natural growth from the new world that he brought into existence by conquering the devil, atoning for our sins, and raising from the dead, and taking that great weapon of death out of the hands of the devil, and not allowing him to terrorize us anymore about our future. So this is my, my next point. My next point is that the latter presents to us a way of life that for us 
is absolutely normative. It's absolutely normative. And a spiritual struggle, what we call in the church asceticism, is simply the Christian life. It's simply the Christian life. Monks don't need to justify themselves and their existence. Married people in Christ don't need to justify themselves. And we both, both those who are living in community in the world and those who are living in Christian community in, in monasteries, both are regulated by the same inner principles. They simply have different external expressions. It's uh, tea time in California, Father. Sorry. It is four o'clock. <laughs> I, I have to have a, have a little help here. Sometimes when we hear that word asceticism, we think, oh no, oh no. We think that it means a withdrawal, necessarily it means a withdrawal from the world. But that's not what asceticism means. Asceticism means struggle. Struggle in the, in, in the Christian sense. That doesn't mean, sometimes we use the word struggle and we don't, we don't really know what we mean by it. We really mean, when we use it, we mean um, weakness. Or when we say I'm struggling, sometimes we mean I'm failing or I'm not accomplishing what I need to be doing. That's not how it's used in our ascetic literature and the literature of the church. Struggle is actually a virtue. And it's the effort to try to love God in your circumstances, to try to love your neighbor in your circumstances, to work against yourself, right? To struggle against any disposition, any feeling or urge that is within us that isn't pleasing to God. That's, that's struggle. And that's what's presented in the Ladder of Divine Ascent are those areas. He, he depicts them and presents them under 30 steps, 30 steps from earth to heaven. 30 ways to struggle for the kingdom of God. And that's common. That's common to us and to the monks. The distinction we make is not between asceticism and Christian life. They're one and the same. The distinction we make is between the two forms of Christian life, which is marriage or family life in the world and monastic life. Uh, but the core is the same. So the latter, the principles in each of the 30 steps in the latter are absolutely relevant and to be applied to every Christian wherever we are. The exact way that those steps apply depends upon where you find yourself. Uh, do you find yourself uh, a single person, a married person, a widow, a widower, a grandparent, whatever, in the world? Or do you find yourself someone who's living in a monastic context? And then you can take the principles of the latter and you can apply them. The 30 steps begin with the basics and i'll mention his his first three like these are the steps that you have to make even like to get yourself off the ground <laughs> and getting off the ground you know getting a good start is absolutely necessary sometimes we feel like our feet have roots that are growing out of our shoes and and binding us to the ground sometimes especially when we hear the, the lives of the saints like we're going to hear this sunday when we hear saint mary of egypt's life or, or tomorrow night if you go to church and you listen to the life of saint mary when compared to her i mean she literally sought the kingdom of god so aggressively that she was raised off the ground when she prayed and she could walk across the jordan river okay that's not me sadly and sometimes we feel, if you feel like me, sometimes you feel like you're really bound. But the Lord is telling us by these initial steps, look, everyone can make a start up the ladder. And in fact, the Christian life begins with that start. The very, very first step is called renunciation. And everyone knows what that is because no one became a Christian without making a public renunciation, even if you were a baby. It was made for you by your sponsor, by your godparent. This is where the Christian life starts. The first three steps he articulates are renunciation, detachment, renunciation, detachment, and then the new state of every person who has renounced the world, exile. Exile, sometimes it's uh, called, the step is called pilgrimage. So renunciation, detachment, and pilgrimage. And this is where the Christian life starts. The priest says to you, turn west, and do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his service and all his pride? 
and his angels. And you say, I, I do. And then he'll ask you again, have you renounced them? And then he'll tell you to do the most aggressive thing possible for any human being to do. And that is to literally spit in the face of Satan. This is the climax of Christian renunciation. And when it's done, when it's completed, the person is turned towards the east, oriented towards the kingdom of God, which will become the new orientation of a person's life. Reorientation, by the way, conversion, spiritual conversion therapy is, is the Christian way of life. It's being attacked by the woke of our culture who don't like that language. But in fact, that's what we're all, what's what we're about is reorientation we're constantly trying to reorient ourselves from the inside out but that's where it starts it starts with a renunciation of the world it's and saint john is making it clear it's it's not possible to love god and to be of the world it's just not possible we have to decide that we are going to make a a break, a definitive break with the, the system and the valuation of the world. It doesn't mean physically leaving the world. St. Basil in his second letter poses the question, what does, what does withdrawal from the world mean? What does uh, renunciation mean and repentance? He says it doesn't mean physic anything physically. It doesn't mean that you actually have to leave. You can, and many of our saints have, but it means that you have rejected the world system's evaluation. And in your heart, you have decided not, he says, to show sympathy for the works of the flesh, for your body's desires that aren't pleasing to God. That is renunciation. This is the proper concept um, for us. And this is where it all starts. That means that the second step is about letting go, what he calls detachment. This means that the things that were important to you as a person who was not yet devoted to a savior who, who lives in heaven. Your sense of security and attachment no longer is primarily here. You instead attach yourself. You are attached to that place where the person you love most is. And that place is the right hand of the father. Where Christ our savior is. And this is why Paul says that we're to set our affections on the things above where Christ is. He also says to the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await our savior who will come and transform the humble body that we have into conformity with his glorious body by the same power that he has, uh, that, that he utilized in, in raising from the dead. This is the, the next step, a renunciation, a detachment. That means we loosen our grip on the things of this life and the things that the world says are important. And Paul puts it this way to the Corinthians. He says that we who are in the world should not make full use of the world. He goes on, he goes, those who are married should be as though they are not. What an amazing thing to say. So there is a way to live in marriage uh, a, with an earthly mind and there's a way to live in marriage with a heavenly mind. Uh, to, to, to recognize, he says, and this is in 1 Corinthians 7, that the form of this world is passing away. It's on its way out. The world isn't just fallen. It is falling, present participle. It's actually on the way out. And for us, we're affixed. We're affixed now to a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that is not going out anywhere. In fact, it's coming, it's increasing uh, its dominion on the earth, and eventually everything fallen will be gone, and the entire earth and heavens will be renewed, and the new heavens and new earth will become reality, ultimate reality, full reality. There won't be an alternative reality uh, to it. So this is what's behind the second step, which is detachment. The third step is exile, which is the new state that Christians find themselves in. They find themselves uh, as sojourners people who are passing through when i was a, a young man i was uh, 18 years old and i had just got off to college actually i went at 17 when i went off i was in college for a month or two before i became 18 and i used to like to go down to this 
very hip coffee shop in downtown Santa Barbara called Sojourners. Sojourners. <laughs> I love the title. They had great coffee. It was, you know, it was much, very much a hippie hangout. But I love, I love the, I love very much the, the whole concept as a Christian. You know, for us, we love our lands. Every Christian should love the earth that God used to make their bodies, the fathers say. So we should all be patriots and try to look at the good in our nations and support the good there. But there's one land, ultimately. Aslan's land, this is what we love the most. The kingdom of God, this is, this is where we are. And we're looking for it. You know, we're, we're joining that great line of faith pilgrims that goes all the way back to the patriarch Abraham. He's described as never wanting to settle down. You know, he lived in tents, this incredibly wealthy, talented man. He lived in tents because his eyes were looking for a city that was not made by man. But its architect and builder was God, and its foundations were heavenly. He was looking for the heavenly city. And this, that, that quest for the city goes right from, from Genesis 17, where we see it with Abraham, right to the end of the Bible, when the heavenly city literally descends in Revelation 21 and 22, and the new Jerusalem is upon us, and our sojourning comes to an end, so to speak. But this is us. This is step three, is we become pilgrims. We enter into a perpetual exile. And... That's what it means, by the way, that we are parishioners. That word in English, parishioner, comes from a Greek, a Greek word, parikos. And parikos means someone who is, a parikos is someone who's moving through. He's passing on. <laughs> he's going through the house and it, this whole world becomes his house because he's looking for the next one. This is us. This is us. So that's where it starts. That's where the letter starts. These are the the fundamental faith commitments that we make to not be the moment we join to Christ in baptism. We're no longer of the world. We're in the world and we're sent by him into the world with a purpose to light it up and to retard its corruption and to convert it. But we're no longer of it. In the middle of the ladder, so we're going from the initial three. I'll end with uh, a few words about the last chapters. But now let me take you a little bit deeper into the ladder. He lays out in chapter seven a very, very important disposition that carries us through the spiritual quest. In that chapter, he articulates um, the heart, the heart, what the heart of a Christian is possessed by that enables him or her to make progress in the spiritual life. And in order to articulate this, he, had, he actually, as far as we can tell, had to make up a word in Greek. Now, I should say a little bit about uh, semantics and the, the use of words by the church fathers. The church fathers had took a, a very incredible language, the Greek language, which had a massive amount of words and concepts uh, that was formed in fashion through many, many centuries of philosophy and literature. They had that by which to articulate um, to the empire. And at that time, remember the apostles, the Greek was the lingua franca of the Roman Empire for the initial centuries. Latin was spoken in the West, but it, it wasn't as central as Greek. The fathers took Greek words, and they often, they made a little tweak here, a little tweak there to Christianize it. They took um, words and they, they wrote the creed in Greek and filled out words like usia and prosopon and hypostasis, words like this, and they, they worked hard to fill them with Christian meaning. But occasionally, the fathers could find no word at all that could accommodate a Christian reality. One of those cases is St. John wanting to articulate the, the disposition of the Christian heart, but he couldn't find a Greek word to do it, and so he made one up. He took two Greek words, hara and lipi, one means joy and one means sadness, and he put them together to create a compound word, harmolipi. And harmolipi is 
it's hard to translate into English, but it basically ma means joy making sadness or just joyful sadness. <laughs> Now, why would a Greek not have any idea about this word? The, a Greek wouldn't have any idea about this word because it was born. It's the child. The word itself is a child of an experience, an experience that, child, that the Christians were living on the ladder. They had at one and the same time the incredible joy of being in the kingdom of God, not fully, but definitively, having Christ live in their heart, literally taking up his throne on the, in, on the inner chamber of the heart, the fathers say. This is where he takes up residence in baptism. And frankly, that reality of the kingdom of God inside, Paul says this is the essence of the kingdom of God. He says the essence of the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so Christians have this. At the same time, we still have the remnants kind of tied around our legs, so to speak, of the old man. The old man has been dethroned, but God is giving us and asking us to use our freedom in this life to put it to death, to mortify the old man, literally to kill it. He's giving us a chance to cooperate, or as Paul says it, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so because we're not fully gods yet, because they're still in us, uh, as Paul says, right, he finds within himself two strange principles. Uh, on the one hand, he delights in the inner man and the law of God. And on the other hand, he, found, he finds at work in his members another law, a law of the flesh that is at war with his desire to please God. And then it leads him to cry out, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And then, of course, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. For us, being free of condemnation, being God's child, this is our hara. But the remnants, and for some of us, I'm not looking at anybody, but some of us, maybe it's a little more than remnants. <laughs> the, the presence of the old man and you know those that portion of ourselves that is not god's uh this is the leapy the leapy the sadness and so we carry within ourselves both the joy and the sadness and this is the disposition that john says is the authentic christian heart this is chapter seven step seven that guides us through spiritual acquisition now let me shoot to chapters 14 and 15, right smack in the middle uh, of the ladder. These chapters put a special emphasis upon the importance of the body. So far, we've been talking mostly about the heart, but we have, we're, we're more than hearts, even though we're trying to expand our hearts. And from one angle, we're trying to become all heart. That's what we're trying to do. Paul said his heart was opened wide. He put the whole church of Corinth in there and all of his spiritual children. I sometimes have a hard time putting my own wife in there. Shame on me. But our goal is right to expand the heart, to become a heart. But we also have a body and a mind, a conscience, a will, a spirit. And we need to love God with our entire being, which means also... Part of, the, uh, part of the ascent, part of the struggle is learning to fix our bodies. The church fathers, like St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, they both utilized this image. They took it from the Greek philosophers and then Christianized it. The idea of the soul and the body being uh, the difference between a charioteer and the chariot. The body is the chariot, the soul is the charioteer, and in a, in a well-ordered person, the noble soul guides the chariot to accomplish its good intentions. This is how God made us to be. Uh, we want to go help that person over there. Our body says right away and with thanksgiving. Sometimes it says that. But sometimes it says, are you kidding me? You're in bed. 
and you need to stay in bed because you're tired and that's going to hurt. Don't you know when you get out of bed, your ankles are going to hurt? <laughs> Just take your ease and forget that. That person's going to be sick tomorrow too. And you can call them or go visit them and make that nice apple pie for them tomorrow. You don't have to do it today. This is often the response of our bodies. It's as though the chariot has become on top and the charioteer has been smushed in the fall. So for us, part of the spiritual struggle, part of the ascesis, why we fast, for instance, in its bodily aspect, is because we're trying to discipline our appetites, our appetites for food, our appetites for possessions, our appetites for sleep, our appetites for sex. All of these are big appetites that if we consent to them, if we're always giving them what they want, then we are ruined. We are ruined. We will be slaves of the body. And so right in the middle of the ladder, St. John gives us two chapters, 14 and 15, on that, on lust and on that, he calls it that clamorous mistress called the stomach. <laughs> oh. Lust and fasting, lust and fasting are controlling the stomach. And notice he points out, he puts those chapters next to each other because they are so mutually influential. The fathers say there's no way to control your lust. And that's a, a lust for not just sexual things, but a lust for money, a lust for power. There's no way to control lust without fasting. If you tame the stomach, then you have the ability to tame also your lusts and that's even depicted saint john says anatomically by the reproductive organs and the stomach being so closely anatomically related i'm, I'm pointing out those chapters because there is no way to make spiritual progress without accepting the important engagement of the stomach there's no way there you, we'd all, I think, like to take a train that goes around that stop, but keeps taking us, keeps taking us right to paradise. There is no going around that stop. Paradise is acquired through that stop. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, what, are, what we call the Desert Fathers. Mm -hmm. In all of the witness of the Desert Fathers, the most important and most often addressed subject is controlling the stomach. More than anything else that's how fruitful learning to eat clean learning to eat in a disciplined reasonable way and forgive me but you know we americans were the worst people in the history of the human race with regards to food uh, i read a book once that just really deeply impacted me it was by a man named greg cutler i believe his name cutler and it was called fat land how america became the most obese people in the history of the world very oh it hurt it hurt badly to, to read it and but it also showed me how important the subject is if if controlling the stomach is that important we can't we can't miss it we can't miss it chapters 14 and 15 and then let me just end and then i'll answer any questions you have let me end with a, a few comments on the last chapters i think you're going to be shocked at what he puts at the end remember this is the top like, this is the place where, forgive me, most of us are not going to get. Most of us are not going to get here until the Lord returns and we have it instantaneously given to us. <laughs> <laughs> most of us probably aren't going to get there. So let me just read some of the titles, okay? I think you're going to be shocked. Yeah. On, this, is this is step 25. On most sublime humility. He puts that at the top. Of course, you need humility just to start your Christian life, right? If you don't judge, if you don't agree with Jesus that you're a sinner who needs to be saved, there's no going to step one. So we know how important humility is at the beginning, right? Poverty of spirit, Jesus puts as the first step in the, in the Beatitudes. But here, notice, he puts it at the very top because humility is something to be obsessed with your entire Christian life. The last thing you want to do is start your life in humility, become a Christian, become orthodox, be humble. And then next thing you know, 
wow, hey, you know, I'm orthodox. I'm correct. <laughs> and lose your humility. Poof. That is a quick jump right off the ladder, right into the mouth of the beast. So here he's telling us humility is something to be developed your whole life deeper and deeper and deeper. Just think St. Silouan. 26, step 26. And by the way, this chapter is the longest chapter in the entire book by far. By far. It's, it's subject on the discernment of thoughts. I once divided every chapter up by how many pages it was in my text. This, pa this chapter, 36 and a half pages dedicated to this. The next closest one is on obedience, which is chapter four, 34 pages on obedience. I mean, how important is that? He's an abbot writing to, a mon to monks. And yet, and even with regards to obedience, this is more important. And that should tell you something too. How many of us struggle with our thoughts? And are tormented, are tormented by our lack of, of nepsis, our, 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 our lack of attentiveness to our thoughts or concentration in prayer. This, like humility, is something that we should be focused on our entire Christian life. Not grow weary, seeking to deepen it. Because if you really want to see it come to fruition, step 26. 27, on holy quiet or holy stillness. How many of us are trying to sit still? To actually pick up that prayer rope and to try to actually say one time, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and mean it with your whole mind and your mouth and your heart together, bound together in that prayer. It's a lifetime quest, he's saying. Humility, controlling your thoughts, stillness. Chapter 28, on blessed prayer. <laughs> 29, on dispassion, which is learning to be so affixed to God that literally nothing in this life throws you off. You don't detach. You stay affixed to God and nothing can throw you off. And then he ends by promising us at the very top, this is where we're all going to get, the beautiful, full expression of faith, hope, and love this trilogy of the virtues. This is how he ends. This is the, this is the ladder. <coughs> if I was going to give another th talk or go on for another half hour, I, I might tell you more deeply about the very important subject of balance that he's super famous for. St. John is super famous for balance. He talks a lot about in the, in the book about how to give a little here and take a little there uh, and how to keep yourself uh, from getting thrown to an extreme, which really can hurt you. Balance is super important in the spiritual quest. Uh, he talks a lot about the role of a spiritual father, having a, a person who's more advanced than you spiritually, who you can constantly have some interaction with. Um, and he also says a lot, interesting. Matter of fact, he writes a lot of humor, which is very unusual. You would think that in this text, uh, it would be uh, not the place for it. But St. John disagrees. St. John disagrees. He actually sets forth quite a few uh, interesting examples and stories of monks uh, that you just can't help having a huge grin on your face uh, when, you're, when you're reading it. Like when our Lord said, uh, who are you to judge You know the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log a, literally a telephone pole protruding from your own eye no one at the time heard that without just smiling their their face off so anyway i'll stop i'll stop thank you very much father for that wonderful uh, overview we'll uh, i think you've maybe got about 10 minutes um we can take a few questions here i'll, I'll start with one though because i think you touched on it briefly um practical advice in regards to a lay person reading the ladder because you know a lot of people dig into it and they become encumbered by its heaviness from a monastic standpoint and you know if they get to the chapter on the prison then a lot of times they just fall off the cliff so any advice as to how to approach the book yes sure 
Well, first is do approach it. Do approach it. It's read at our monasteries as a rule all over the world in Lent. And often that reading is done in the presence of lay people at trapeza. So it, it, don't listen to anyone who tells you that this book is not for lay people. But you read it as a lay person, right? So it has one message to a monk who's living in the monastery. It has another message to we who are living in the world. Whenever you read, you want to read with your heart. You want to read to gather something from the Lord to you, which is why you shouldn't touch this book and begin your reading without first making your cross and asking the Lord to speak to you. And then when he does speak to you, stop. Stop. Don't tell yourself, well, I'm going to read 15 pages today no matter what. Don't say that. Start reading. You know, the, the monastics created a literary genre called the century. A lot of our, our great fathers wrote in centuries. And what centuries are, are 100 paragraphs. And they're written as complete thoughts. And the reason that they wrote this way, the reason they invented this genre, is so that a monk in his cell, or a nun in her cell, when she gets up and she's doing her devotion, can pick up and read one paragraph and stop and understand and and imagine like it's an almond in your mouth and you're you're just sucking on it and you're enjoying the taste and you're feeling it dissolve on your tongue this is the idea you you're looking at the point from this angle and that for the purpose not of head knowledge alone but application so that's how i would say read rather than saying oh i'm, I'm gonna have to read every page Read chapter by chapter, but stop as soon as God answers your prayer. Mm -hmm. Stop and think about what that means in your life, like what you can do for your life. You know, I was taught this when I was a catechumen myself. I, I had the privilege when I was a catechumen back in 1992 to live very near this nun. Uh, she's 80 now, so I guess she would have been 50 then. And she told me, she said, Father, I was asking her about prayer. She says, Father, prayer is like this. When you're using the Jesus prayer, you're standing at the door of the kingdom of God and you're knocking. And you're knocking. You're saying you're, you're like that person who would, that the Lord encouraged to always pray and never faint. She says, but when, then she said, but when the Lord opens the door and he visits you, stop mm -hmm. and enjoy it. He goes, what are you going to do? Keep knocking on his forehead? The door is open. Hello, anybody there? Anybody there? Uh, it, it impacted me deeply. I thought, you know, we pray for communion. We, we draw near to God to be near him. And sometimes he visits us. And especially if we make a prayer ahead of time in spiritual reading, and we're touching the pages as though we're touching Jesus's very clothes. That's what Elder Emiliano says. We should think of the scriptures are the clothing of Jesus. He's literally found in there. And then when he speaks to you, stop and meditate and apply. And if it doesn't help you, if you're reading the prison, just scooch on, just scooch on. Any questions? Anyone just uh, unmute and ask. That is fine. It can be about anything you want. I'm sure uh, Father can defend himself ably, no matter what it is. So uh, <laughs> that's quite all right. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. It's really important. When you do your weekly, like the reflections that we can see on YouTube, the way you have the camera angled, it looks like on your bookcase that you've got Rushdeny's book. Am I right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got like five or six or seven of his books. <laughs> I thought it was, but I just wanted to confirm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, you're talking to a former Presbyterian. Uh -huh. Hello, cousin. <laughs> Hello, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the baggage dies slowly, doesn't it? <laughs> so. Come on, father. <laughs> okay, anyone else with a question? Um, I did have a question. Um, I wrote my question down so that I could uh, get through it without stumbling. So if you don't mind, I will read <laughs> off a page. Um, earlier last week, you put out a video on the Patristic Nectar um, YouTube page. It was titled, What is a Woman? Uh, which responded wonderfully to the gender confusion that's happening in our society. 
And um, as a woman, I very much loved what you had to say about the preciousness of our gender and how it's a gift. My question is, how do you think we as Orthodox Christians can respond to loved ones who don't share our faith or our belief in God, but who are experiencing that kind of confusion? It's difficult to know how to na navigate the line between responding with meekness and love and to rebuke an evil, which has so many of our young people enthralled. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how we can both refute ideology, but maintain love. Um, that's supposed to be the characteristic of our Christian faith. A wonderful question, sweetheart, and you articulated it so well. For us, we have a commitment to do both. And in our culture, it's almost impossible to be allowed to do both. Um, our culture functions on the presupposition that you can't do both. That if you uh, would dispute uh, a, an affirmation, that that is necessarily unloving. And, and we don't agree. We don't agree. So, I mean, let me give you an example with regards to this particular subject of gender confusion. Uh, and of course, that, that's just the latest iteration of the sexual revolution. We've, we've been addressing one tragedy, one sorrow after another for 50 years. Mm. Whether it was legalized adultery or no-fault divorce or abortion or I mean, just one thing after another after another. And we always have to do the two, the two things at the same time. We have to love people and, and be very clear that we want them 100% with us. So I've tried over my 30 years here as a priest, I've tried to say to my people, whenever the latest iteration comes up, we want every one of these people in our church, everyone. Mm. And we won't rest until they are, because God doesn't rest until they are. We're here to gather. We're, we're here to gather. At the same time, we will speak the truth as much as we possibly can. And how you say it and to whom you say it are very sensitive things. It's one thing to, it's one thing to have a conversation with someone who's in great pain and is deeply confused. That person needs an embrace, that person needs a listening ear, that person needs great patience. It's something else to address um, a hardened activist that is trying to actually um, burn your church down. That's okay. different. And this is why our Lord was, was able to do both. He was able to so tenderly restore the woman caught in adultery and at the same time to issue uh, very serious woes and pronounce horrifying judgment upon those who were proud and glorying in their unrighteousness. It's a very hard thing to do, but if we love Christ, then we have to try to do both. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, Father, I know that you've got to get going because you're 10 minutes from service. So let me thank you on behalf of everyone here. Uh, that has just been a real pleasure to have you. I'm glad we could make it work. And uh, let me offer you a, an early uh, Kali Anastasis. And to you, and, Father. Uh, and I, hope it's, uh, I hope it's all wonderful as we're coming out of this uh, COVID craziness, hopefully. I hope the same for you. And Father, I... Uh... I'm not holding any grudge, even though Lee has been gone far too long. Uh, she's supposed to have come back. Uh, there's no bitterness here. No, no, there's no bitterness. No bitterness. Well, well, I can tell. You, Everybody sends their love, and they'll be very happy that I saw you on this. Yes, Father. <laughs> Father, please give our dear Presbytera my love. I, miss I absolutely her. will. I'll give her your love, and I'll give it to everybody else, too. Please do. Thank you, Father. God bless you all, and a wonderful Holy Week and Pascha to you all. Okay, thank you, Father. Take care.